Welcome to another episode of Hot Topics. We are so excited that you could join us tonight. As you can see, we have many guests with us. Um, so I'm actually not going to speak too much. We're going to start with an introduction of everyone. And as you know, the context that they're speaking from. Um, but we're going to start over here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tando. I'm a student, a full-time student. And my pronouns are she or her. Thank you. My name is Gary Rivas, and I'm a bishop of the Central Synod and a pastor here at Grace Point. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Swana. I am a clinical psychologist, a Methodist, queer. I, my pronouns that I prefer is he. So, yeah. That's amazing. Um, hi, everyone. You know me. I am Rebecca. I'm part of the Hot Topics team, and I am, that's the context I'm speaking from. Yeah. Good evening, my name is Khoni, and I'm part of the Hot Topics team. Hey everyone, my name is Ilza, also part of the Hot Topics team with Khoni and Rebecca, also part of Grace Point, so it's wonderful to be with you tonight again as we continue our Hot Topics conversation. Amazing, thank you so much. So, um, for those of you who've been watching, you know that we are on this Privileged series, and we've come to a really... Um, a really hot topic tonight, which is heterosexual privilege. And we were really intentional about the guests that we had on here. And just before we started rolling, uh, my dad just said to everyone, just be, completely be yourself. And that's exactly what we want with our answers tonight and with our conversations. So I'm just going to kick us right off. Defining sexuality. Um, I think over the years we've heard so many new terms of LGBTQI. Like, I think at one point it was just LGBT and then as, um, I guess, society developed, the, um, the acronym developed, you know? So I think maybe can we speak about your experience or how you define your sexuality? And we'll go around and we'll just, yeah. So Tanzo, can we start with you? Okay. Um, I wouldn't really say there is a specific definition that I use because I strongly believe that sexuality is very fluid. And I also believe I'm pro-choice, so if a person feels comfortable in who they are and who they choose and how they choose to express themselves, then I am for that. So I wouldn't really say there is a specific definition to it. However, um, it is defined as preferred where, who you prefer to date or who you, who you were born to date, as people would say it. So yeah, that's it. I think for me, uh, no, I yeah, don't think there's any uh, order to the okay. to that. The, the, way in which we talk or do sexuality is different from me. One, I think society has a definition of gender. Um, again, the framework is that that stems from heterosexual privilege, um, which then suggests that there is binaries. There's a male and a female, a girl and a boy. Um, so our framework of thinking about gender stems from that. Now, sexuality then gets convoluted into all of this because we don't have a languaging that is appropriate, that is not within the framework of what we know already of this, of this and that. And again, when society speaks of sexuality, in their minds, they speak of sex. Um, and again, going back to a female or a male, they don't think of all of these specific nuances now of homosexuality, bisexuality, and all of these other kind of entities. So now, if you think about human sexuality as a broad definition, it accommodates the reality of sexualities, but not one form of sexuality. But what heterosexual um, lenses and scripts give us is that this is it, and if you do not subscribe to this, then it means you are wrong. Hence now, we've got a subcategory of homosexuality because it, it, it actually protests the old understanding of what we know of homosexuality or heterosexuality. So if again you come to church, church has got only one script, that of heterosexuality. Yeah. Hence, again, today we would not be talking about it if there was not that dominant narrative of what the Bible prescribes, that of Adam, and Eve, not Adam and Adam, not Eve and Eve, right? So, and, and probably Gabriel, I should touch on that, but there are different forms and groups in society that have different definitions of what we mean and what we talk about sexuality or human sexuality. 
But for me, as a gay man, um, I believe sexuality is not only about who am I attracted to, why am I attracted to that person, but it's about my being. And I've kind of corrected people lately when they say, um, that gay guy, yeah. or that lesbian girl, or that um, trans woman, or that trans man, I always say, it's better to say, Anele, who is gay, right? Instead of, because you, by doing that, by putting my being of how I related sexually or in terms of my sexual orientation, you're actually undermining my existence in the room. So if you then say, Anele, who is gay, then I'm happy with that. And that's my, that's my understanding of it. But again, for us to have a broad, uniform definition, it, it's very difficult. And again, it's cultural, and it's political, and it's context-specific. How we talk about our sexual orientation as queer people is different from how heterosexual people talk about it. Yeah. So that's my, my view around this whole thing. Thanks, Anele. I think you've highlighted a really important point for me personally and that just my understanding of identity and sexuality that, you know, identity is a very complex thing. It's very easy to simplify it and say, my identity is this and this and this. But I think sexuality is a part of identity. It's yeah. not the sole factor that informs one's identity. Uh, my understanding of sexuality is that it's something that's discovered and not necessarily chosen. Um, and I think that's a position that's been quite debated within the church circles, whether it is, in fact, it's just I wake up one day and I've decided I'm going to be this, or if it's discovered over encounters and experiences relating to people and society? I think for myself in that, um, I, I, I think I'd, I would agree with you, Tando, is that I would not want to see myself in any fixed label of sexuality at all. Um, I, and so I don't ascribe to being either heterosexual or homosexual or... And I think... So to your... And I'll tell you why. Because to, to your point, um, Anela, is that why, why do we say my black neighbor or my white neighbor, yeah. you know? Why do we do that? Is it not just our neighbor, yeah. you know? So why does it have to be gay Anele or Anele who's gay? Why, why can we not just talk about, Anele. you know, uh, let's just talk about Tando, you know? We don't say that, to, I don't say uh, Lorne the heterosexual, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't, but now all of a sudden, we feel that we have to label, and I think the labeling becomes an issue, you know? So back to the sexuality thing, is that, and I know there's nothing, for me personally, when someone says I don't see color, I've got a problem with that because I think we do see color. And that's okay. It's okay to see color, you know, um, because we identify a person and it's not, it's not that that's the overriding thing. You are who you are. It's not because you're black, but you are who you are. But this thing of not seeing color just doesn't make sense. It just underwrites a whole thing. But I go back to Paul when Paul says, um, when Paul says there shall, there's no male or female, you know, slave or free. So even in Paul's understanding, although we can debate his, some of his teachings later on, For sure. but in one moment, Paul does say there is neither male nor female. So if you take it back to Adam and Eve, well, Adam, in fact, we understand Adam in the male form. But actually, if you take the contrast between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it's very different. Adam is actually not seen just in a male form mm -hmm. at all. At all, you know. Um, but it's our understanding of how we like to label people. Male, female, female gay, queer, heterosexual. And so for me personally, from a sexuality perspective, um, I think that sometimes, and you spoke about the chromosomes, I think that sometimes I, I'm more one than the other in a sense, you know, and w what does that mean? You know, I'm, I, I just, sexuality for me, as you said, Tanda, for me is actually fluid. And not, not about, um, and, and I'm not talking about dating someone or sleeping with someone or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sexuality. How do you even begin to frame that? I'm more than just a male. So with all of this in light, in light of everything that we've just spoke about, what has made it difficult then for the church to even land itself in terms of sexuality? What, made it, what makes it difficult for the church to understand that sexuality does not inform our identity? And how, what makes it difficult for the church to create a space where people as they express themselves on any given day to feel as though they're included and just before you answer that question because I, I, th I think Tano Nonele 
I think whenever you mention the church, and when, actually when you say that, and my dad will be able to attest to this, you know when we go on a church camp or something's happening, and a lot of the pastor's selling points is, oh, you might meet your future husband, like come to the church camp, or you might meet your, your future spouse or whatever. And, I never and, do that. No, no, but I'm just saying you would have experienced it. But I think that for me, um, I was actually on Instagram the other day, and there was this, I'm not going to name names, even though I'd love to. Um, but, you know, they'll take a picture of their son and say, oh, my two-year-old son met another girl today, might have met his wife today, you know. And it's like they've normalized the sexualization of young kids. And it's just, it almost seems like sexuality in the church specifically, and also in the secular world, but like is this, it's this, this binary um, male and female, whereas like, yeah, so that is just what I wanted to add in terms of that. So how do we, with the church? Can, can I be, I know you, uh, I would like to hear per, from like a, the, or your personal experience, I'm, I answer whatever you're going to be saying just anyway, but maybe your personal experience being queer and in the church, okay. and, and maybe the, the same for you in that, you know, so what has your personal experience yeah. been? Okay. Yeah, I think for, just drawing what you highlighted, Gary, earlier, Society loves labeling and categories. So um, we, we need a category and labeling for everything and anything. So even in the queer community, we need these codes of labels to say I am gay, but I either identify as top or bottom mm -hmm. or versatile, or um, now it's either I'm verse top or verse bottom, because within the queer community again, we need that labeling so that I know where I stand in relation to you, yeah, right? Even, if you're even yeah. So then we need uh, we need labeling for us. In society, has one labeling. If you are gay, it means you are all attracted to other men, but they don't understand the politics within mm -hmm. how these all of those things. And again, this labeling is a function for society because heterosexual privilege is at the top. So anything that is not heterosexual is at the sub. It forms sub of this and it disrupts anything. Again, within heterosexual um, hierarchy, I as a gay man, I still hold male privilege mm. because I'm still a male. So if I'm applying for a job um, with T, um, who might also identify as a lesbian woman, you will realize that chances are, by virtue of my male privilege, chances are I will get it because I'm, I'm a male. And by virtue of her being a lesbian woman, she'll be categorized differently. So coming back to what Gary is speaking about in terms of my journey and experience of how I position myself in church, it has been a very interesting um, journey for me in the sense that I don't know, I always say to Kling, what, how much of my privilege as a black, educated, middle-class black man has made it easier for the church to accept me, right? Because I'm a psychologist, um, again, that comes with middle class or high class privilege. It's a profession that is full of white privilege. So I benefit from that privilege. Two, I am educated, a master's student, a master's graduate, a PhD candidate, and all of those things, right? So in how I talk and position myself in society and church, being gay is, by the way, Right. Um, compared, I'm curious as to how about a gay man who's from Soweto who may not have all of these things and how they influence their positionality. Again, in the MCSA, I hold different kinds of powerful positions and spaces. There, again, me being queer, really, we can think about it, but we benefit from your intellectual capacity and your professional opinions and all of that. So for me, on the basis of that, it has been easier. However, then, if I then proclaim vehemently, I become, I make other people uncomfortable, right? Even when I preach and all of that, like, oh, he's a good preacher. Immediately say, he's gay. Then there's a problem. It seems as though your, your exaltation becomes lowered because you've got something that disrupts the purity and presence of God that God cannot speak through this problematic sex body. Right. <laughs> so that's for me. And again, because of my resilience and my understanding of scripture and theology, I've had the capacity 
to renegotiate that in my mind. But I'm worried of an other layperson sitting down who may not have the theological complexities of how I understand God. I always say to my friends, if the Bible really tells us that we are imago Deo, kind of image of God, if I see a disabled person, then it means God is disabled. Because that's the image of God. That disabled person did not create him or herself. Now, it goes as far as saying, if I'm gay and I'm the image of God, then it means God is gay. <laughs> so there's nothing of God that exists that has no God's imprint in it. Yeah. Right? So for me, how I've negotiated my way in church, it's only one person that I look up in the cross that on the day he died for me, there was nothing exclusive. My sexual orientation was not the big prize. But my being and my proclamation that Jesus is my Lord and Savior extends who I sleep with. It's, yeah, Tando, Tando, please, please. go for it, please. Um, okay, I think my experience is far different from his, as he has mentioned his privileges. However, me growing up in the church, uh, I got to experience people telling me how it's a phase, it will just yeah. pass through. And I think as I grow up, I found my voice and I was able to speak up for myself and what I believe in and who I, who I truly am. And it has been problematic for a lot of people, honestly, because there was a time where I felt like, okay, I guess I do not have a place in this house because now no one is willing to listen or rather no one is willing to, I wouldn't say compromise, but no one is willing to compromise in what they believe in in order to accommodate me. And I'm not here to be accommodated by anyone, but I'm just here to seek the Lord. And everyone else turned a blind eye to that and focused on Tando being lesbian, still being a child and developing and might grow out of it. So I still believe that I'm still finding my voice, but there are a lot of people who strongly believe that I'll grow out of it. It's more like this church becomes a corrective emotional experience and church becomes a corrective space that if you accept Jesus, then you'll be healed. Yeah. So there's a matter of, and again, sinfulness and illness. Yeah. So if you come, in, sorry, time to mention something about the house. And for me, there's always a difference between a house and a home. Yeah. I always say, as queer people, we create homes. She's my homie. But at my house, chances are I may not be acceptable. But because she's my homie, we understand each other. Uh, uh, Tando, you're saying that it was really important. It's almost like your, your, your lesbianism is like the flu. You know, you'll get over it, yeah. you know, yeah. at some stage, you know. Yeah. Corona. Corona, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that for me, one thing, and we have, I know we've dealt with uh, systemic racism and all the issues, but the stuff around gender-based violence uh, has been very real for us in, in the country. One of the things that really horrifies me beyond mention is the corrective rape as, as so-called, uh, that, that happens in that way. It's more than, and I, and I think that you are being quite compassionate mm -hmm. to us as a community because um, it's, for some people, it's more than just you'll get over it. Yeah. But for some people, it'll be let me show you what heterosexual means mm -hmm. and then participate in the whole corrective. And I know it's a very real issue that we're facing in yes, our society. Um it is, and you'd be surprised that there are, there was someone who belonged to the church who once told me that I need to explore with guys in order to be sure that I'm lesbian. And I think for me, I, I, still, re, I still remember that incident because I felt like he, he rejected me in a way and suggested other alternatives that are suitable for him. Yeah. And I think that is what... Um, we are expected to do growing up in the church to kind of fit into what people want instead of being allowed to be yourself. So you're not really allowed to be who you want to be in the church. You can come wearing whatever that you want to wear on any other days, but on specific occasions, you need to look this way and represent yourself in this way because you're a female, you have to wear a skirt 
or we've once seen you in a skirt, so why is it a problem now? Yeah. So also, I think that's another huge issue whereby queer bodies run away from the church simply because they do not feel like it's a place or a space where they can freely be themselves and choose to present themselves in any way that they would want to. You know, um, the last two weeks we've been speaking about male privilege. And last week, um, I, I just mentioned that the, the way that I experience um, oppression as a white woman is completely different um, as to how a black woman will experience male privilege. Because by virtue of my skin color, I'm privileged, okay? Um, and I, I, I kept saying this last week that um, I'm oppressed, but I'm also an oppressor. I have the capacity to oppress black women. Um, and I spoke about how bla being a black woman in South Africa is the hardest person to be because just you now holding white women on top of you um, as in trying to um, be oppressive towards you. And I think now maybe being a lesbian black woman must bring it a whole nother set of of because now you're not just black and a woman, but you're also lesbian. I don't know if you're comfortable maybe to speak into like that experience, uh, if you can, if you'd like to. Um. Um, I think I wouldn't really speak about it um, mainly on church basis, but generally, where when you wake up in the morning, you first need to think about where you're going, and I think I've also. Growing up, I've also seen and heard about people who were correct, corrective rape. And there was someone closer to home who was murdered because she was lesbian. And they had believed that raping her and possibly murdering someone would change everyone else who's lesbian in our community. So I think it is also one of those where you can't take that out of your mind where I might find a completely strange person who who would feel like if they rape me, then they're doing me a favor by turning me into a straight woman. And, or maybe they're doing someone else a favor by showing them an example that if you're lesbian, or rather, if we see you like this, then we'll do this. So therefore, come to us like this. And I think it is one of those things where you don't feel completely safe in any in most of the environments, unless you are home or unless you feel at home in whatever place that you're in. So I think that is one of the major issues that one faces, the homophobia around it. Thanks so much, Tando. I think you've highlighted that there's such a um, great discrepancy between treatment and how um, the community might be treated in the church. And just, I've been doing a little bit of research on this recently this year. Um, I'm finishing up my studies, and one of the things that I've been doing is around um, heterosexuality and homosexuality and things like that. And I've just, I found in the church there's um, like three positions that, that I generally come across when I'm reading some research, and that is that um, within the church, either you might be accepted and you are invited to become part of the church do you find some churches that will accept you with conditions to say you are welcome in the church but you cannot um, be in leadership you cannot this you cannot that and you find some churches that will blatantly just reject you and say that it's wrong um, and then some churches I found just the practical implementation of that um, what you were speaking about you know the corrective rape uh, there were things also around um, treatment you know, where it's to say conversion therapies, that this is something that you need to be cured from. To find some things also um, around prayer and that you need to be exercised. And so I wanted to maybe hear from you guys what some of your experiences have been, if you've experienced um, a range of different treatments in the church and those types of things, or if it's been like a very specific expression within the church of how people have treated you. Probably from my experience is I I find the systems in church the MCS is a very interesting subject. It's with its microaggressions. Mm. It's very subtle, it's nice. We it seems as though to me, as much as we don't have a like a clear stance as the MCS, you know, we're nice, like, no, 
we easily accept you. You can participate in our services and everything and everything else. But only one thing we're going to do is to bless you <laughs> and all the nice things. So it's more like the MCSA says, you can have the cake, but not the cherry on top. Mm. Right. Um, so we can do everything. You can buy everything. You can, you can bring in your illegitimate child to be blessed. Yeah. Right? Mm. And we don't care whether is it wedlock or out of wedlock, mm. but we can baptize your child. For as long as it's brought by a mother and a father, we don't have a reservation of, I never bring your son through surrogacy. Mm. It could have been through surrogacy, it could be through adoption, or any form of that. So we give him a cake, but not the cherry on top. Mm. Right? And again, there's always a sense that I need to be careful. I can be so nice to be here, talk about me being queer, but say I must go to the rural areas yeah. and speak about that and do all of those things. It's problematic. So from my experience, I kind of, I mean, in, in, a, in a position of privilege that I don't have to face all that which probably some of the lay people are facing, but I can fully agree to say how other queer bodies are misplaced in church. A simple example in PE last week, a young man was raped by a pastor. He went to the police station, and the police station was told that don't come with your son's attendances here. Hmm. Right? He went to the church. They couldn't register that a pastor can rape a young man. It had to be a protest by society for that to be that. There are many people, I have never said this in public. I was almost raped by a Methodist minister, but I kept quiet, right? There we are, we went into a Wesley Guild thing, shed the bed, you trust the minister? And I had something, I didn't pay attention to it, right? Then eventually, I saw some movements that were happening. I'm shocked. I don't know what to do. Chances are I may not be believed when I say that. Mm -hmm. The least I did was to leave the room. And funny, when I moved to the next, the friend that I had slept with, he knew what was going on with his friend, who's a minister. And then he, th he said to me, why did you leave? Because he was trying to make advances to you. But the difficult thing for me was, with my already pre-existing history of me being molested as a young boy, that triggered mm. a lot of things. A place where I should have been having safety, yeah. it's a place that becomes a trigger of unsafety. A person I look up to as my minister failed me at that time, yeah. right? So it was not even just about the matter. I knew that I'm gay, but the dissonance I had I thought this is a place that will offer me something different. Till to this day, the guy still does not fully comprehend mm -hmm. the depth and the intensity of his actions. But it still leaves with me to say, I could have been raped by a Methodist minister. Sure. Uh, I, I, I'm actually going to throw the next one, you know, to everyone, but particularly to Gary. You know, it's... it's so the sense I guess is that the Methodist Church has had a lot of conversations. There's been a lot of conversations from Ducom. For those who do not know, at Ducom is it's our doctrine and ethics, doctrine, doctrine, ethics and worship committee, where they speak about Methodist doctrine, ethics and worship stuff. Um, and there's been a lot of conversation about um, sexuality and everything. But there is a sense in which I sometimes, as a person who's spectating from the outside, I sometimes get the sense that we say a lot about homosexuality, but we've got, we do not say much about behavioral ethics and ethics that will help them feel as though they're protected. And I say them as though I am othering the other. I do not mean it in that sense. Yeah. But that will help the community feel protected in the church and also help the community feel as though they're being shepherded. Because the reality is, as Khuni as a young person, I've had stuff that I've had to deal with. But the tools have been there as a heterosexual person within the Methodist church to say, dude, you just messed up here. Pick up your, you know, and journey on. But I feel as though the church is very silent, but instead we just judge, 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 and we do not show that voice and 
that voice of compassion and care for the community that protects and guides? I think, Lonnie, is that, you know, the, my, real, my realization about the church is this, is that you can legislate as much as you like, even for the country. So we legislate relation, uh, marriages, same-sex relationship, uh, marriage, we legislate all of that. It doesn't deal with our homophobia. Yeah. It doesn't deal with our, our, for me, it's a heart issue, yeah. you know. So even in the church, we can legislate, but while we still have a very strong patriarchal view of who God is, patriarchal view in terms of of everything you know until we start looking at, 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 at for me it's a heart issue you know because we can legislate um stuff around the same sex um you know being society stewards or circuit stewards we can do all of that when you go into a congregation let's just take the issue of women in ministry there's absolutely no legis from a, le a discipline perspective there's not <coughs> one paragraph in our book of order that says as a female you cannot be a minister but you speak to women ministers in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa they will tell you about the bias against them you know so we've legislated against it you know um, but the heart is still not um, I was speaking to um, a woman minister on Thursday and she said how many times she's uh, arrived in a church and they have said to her face well you'll be okay because the church has sent her there you'll be okay until we get a male minister. You know, we'll do, we'll, we, to her face, we will, we, will, um, uh, we will accept you until we get a real, mini a real minister, which is a male minister. So my point is this, uh, Lonnie, is that the church can debate, and I think that part of the church's debate is just stalling it. You know, we're just stalling and stalling and stalling uh, because we're too scared to make a call on it. But my issue is this, even when we make a call on it, it's not going to. It's not going to deal with the issue. We think that uh, the savior of this thing is in us legislating it. It's not. It's about a change of heart. It's about unpacking understandings of scripture, contextualizing strip, scripture, exegeting scripture. It's about a work and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, and and let me say this to you. I'm tempted to say that we've gone a far away because that's our excuse. Well, we've gone. Off, so we say to women ministers, don't worry. Look how many, how many, you know, so we, we keep on saying, well, we've gone, we've done a lot, we've gone a far away and all the rest of it. It's, it's, it's actually not a stand. So we sought here in our church at, at Grace Point in there, when we spoke about our openness to having um, uh, homosexuals, uh, same people in same-sex relationship to be an absolute welcoming part of this community, we had a lot of people vote with their feet and leave the church, you know. So then I start getting confused, Tanda, because... I look at the teachings of Jesus, of our welcoming and accepting, and, you know, I, 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 it, it's a heart issue, you know. Uh, trust me, we have people in this church saying, um, why do we sing vernacular songs? I don't understand what I'm saying. So I'm, I'm, and they leave. You know, as if God is really interested in what language we sing in. I mean, really, you know, does it make it less spiritual because it's in uh, Isizulu, you know? So it's a, we, I think we're fundamentally struggling with a heart issue. So when it comes to um, the same-sex debate or this, this topic, um, my, I, I, so number one, I have to say to you, and I said it this morning and I said it in my synod address yesterday for our synod, I said I'm a recovering racist and I'm a recover. I want to say to the two of you, I'm a recovering homophobic, you know, because there's a, there's a prejudice in me. You know, it's a, there's an inbuilt prejudice in me as a human being, you know. And it's not just around that. Because my understanding of what it means to be lesbian or what it means to be queer is so far off. I wish I could say I've got friends who are queer because that normally works. If say I've got black people. I'm not a racist because I've got black friends uh, who are queer, you know. But until I'm, until I'm, and I'm not saying for me now, just, but until I'm in relationship and sitting down around having a cup of coffee with Anele and, um, and having a, just a bit of an understanding of the, of the journey that he's been. So I've learned so much today. I've known him for a long time and I've heard him speak many occasions, but I've learned more today than I have in all the years that I've known him. Tanda, you came up with such in incredible perspectives, seriously, that just, uh, could you mind if I ask how old, I think it's rude to ask a person how old it is. It? I don't know, I forget. Is it rude to ask? No, it's not. How old are you? Uh, I'm 21. So, you know, I've learned so much from you today in the brief 
40 minutes that we've had, 20, 30 minutes we've had together. And why? It's because we sit around the table yeah. and we talk to each other. You know, um, so for me, sorry, Clooney, I've, I've gone on a bit, but for me, it's a hot issue. We can legislate as much as we want, but it's a hot issue that I think we need to have a bit of conversion taking place in our hearts. Mm -hmm. This conversion that we have as Christians is more than just a conversion where we convert to be a Christ follower. We cannot convert, Clooney, around issues that we are comfortable with. Yeah. That's not, conver that's not a, yeah. we can't be half converted. I can't be converted and still be racist or homophobic or judgmental against the poor or, or, or be um, sexist. It, it, it doesn't work that way. So I admit, I'm a recovering racist, I'm a rec recovering homophobe, all of that. But I'm working on a conversion because my conversion is complete. I can't leave some stuff outside the conversion. Sorry. I just wanted to pick up on just a few things because we have a few more minutes left. Anneli, when you were talking about the image of Jesus and, uh, and what Jesus died for, you know, like the last concern was whether Anneli is gay or whether Tanda was lesbian or whether Rebecca is straight, I held my breath when you said it because that made me uncomfortable. And I had to ask myself, do I get uncomfortable when Jesus is not spoken about in that way? You know, like, I, like as in, sorry, let me just clarify that a little bit more. Do I get uncomfortable when Jesus is, when homosexual, uh, like um, the LGBTQI community doesn't come into the conversation? And my family and friends will know for years, this is something I'm extremely, extremely pa passionate about. Um, it has been on my brother's, my brother and my heart since forever. But there's still moments where I catch my breath and I'm like, that's, that, that's really um, brave of you to speak about, but me catching my breath, it shows an internal bias in me. It shows, you know how systemic racism, I as Rebecca have systemic racist tendencies that I need to work through every day and catch myself in. How do we as the church stop holding our breath when this comes up? How do I sit next to Anele and next to Yutando and I don't become like stiff because I'm like, is Anele going to offend someone? Is Tando going to offend someone? Because I love, I, I offend people. It's my, my personality offends people. The things I believe in offends people. In fact, people. it's a spiritual gift. Of no, <laughs> it is a spiritual gift. It is. I, I, I don't, I'm not uncomfortable when I offend people. I don't feel this need. But why did I get, why did I get uncomfortable there? So how do we as a church stop holding our breath? I think for me, Jesus is the ultimate destructor of heteronormativity. He destabilizes, actually, Jesus destabilized everything. Um, the Sabbath rules, the Old Testament rule. In fact, he came in and modified certain things, um, healed people on Sabbath, did everything not within what society knows. And so I'm saying, if I'm a follower of Jesus, a true disciple, then it means I've got to follow the one who called me, or who I'm embodying. So I believe that my life as a subject is problematic because I have beings or kind of identities that are problematic. Number one, about my faith, I believe in Jesus and my ancestors, right? I'm gay, I'm a problematic person, um, and I don't subscribe to some of the things that people do subscribe. At least when I'm at church, I become compliant. But when I'm, com when I'm beyond compliance, then I leave. I was even saying Gero to my other friend, I think lockdown has given me a perspective. I'm good without church. Because it has made me realize it's only about going to the building and for fellowship. I've learned to fellowship with myself and those around me at home. Right? So how then I live with the discomfort of being uncomfortable with other people are living with is that I know Jesus is not only in church. Jesus is everywhere. And so for me to constantly live with that, I understand that my sexuality is problematic. I understand that I've got the responsibility of making my fellow congregants and everyone understand that me being homosexual does not 
um, deprive me from accessing Jesus? Sure. Track forward to 2030 <laughs> as we're about to close. Track forward to 2040. 20 years after this, there's a new lockdown. How do you create a church space that can make sure that Kloni's great-great-grandchild, Anella's great-great-grandchild, whoever, sits at home, regardless of whether they're homosexual, heterosexual, regardless of their sexuality, they sit at home and they genuinely miss the church. How do you create a space where they genuinely feel like, I miss home? Because I feel like, you know, I totally, I understand, you know, where most of us are coming from. We're like, jeez, man, I don't miss that guy, Kloni, who judges me whenever I say something, you know? I think I'm better off at home. You know, how do we make sure that next lockdown, even if it's 50 years down the line, that we create a space where people would genuinely miss and they would say, I can't wait to go back. Regardless of sexuality. Absolutely, yeah. You know? So maybe that can be close. We'll start Tando, um, Gary, and Ellie, and then we'll, we'll close. Okay. Um, I think the first step to reaching that ultimate goal is to educate people around us educate the person next to you. And I believe that through educating one person, you educate a whole lot of people. So I think we should be the ones to inform people about how we want to be treated and how we would like to be treated. And maybe they could even do better on their own. When you tell a person how to treat you and they could discover better ways in order to be able to accommodate you and to love you and accept you for who you are. And not to force people to accept you, but rather let them go through the process on their own so that by the time they get to that point where they say, I've accepted that Tando is lesbian, it is not through because I forced them to do so, but it's, but it's because they have learned and they have truly accepted, truly in their hearts. It sounds like I'm coming against you, Anneli, but I'm not. <clears throat> I don't want you ever to be comfortable in church. Because you just said that Jesus is, was a rabble rouser. And I, somehow, I think you hinted at the fact that you're also a rabble rouser. You, <laughs> in a nice way. And I'm saying that he, really in love. in love. I really am. I don't, church ever, I don't ever want church to be a comfortable place to come to. Because it's going to convict us. But I can tell you this, Sanele, you are, your role, and also for you, Tando, your role in the church is critical. And I want to tell you something, this sounds, I'm trying to not sound patronizing. If the church continues to condemn queer lesbian people and chase queer lesbian people out of the church, the church will be poorer and will not truly be the body of Christ at all, at all. It will not be a true reflection of the body of Christ. It is an indictment, and you're right on the church to say that actually being at home is much better. I prefer staying in my pajamas and my cappuccino in bed. I've even enjoyed it more <laughs> than coming here, and I'm paid to be here. Um, but church will always, because of the Spirit of God, will always make us uncomfortable in a sense. My dream would be that when Anele comes to church and when Tando comes to church, that it's not seen Anele who is queer, but it's Anele and Tando who come. And so whether you're a minister or you become a society steward or a Wesley Guild leader, that you are not disqualified because of your sexuality. And I think the church would be poorer if you never came. And I know you didn't say you're not coming. Uh, can I just disturb you for a moment? I feel like what I have done, my role is to bring my queer friends along in order to be able to show everyone in the church that we do exist and we do have a role to play. And in them seeking God, I've been that one person to say, come through, let's, let's go through this journey together. And you being queer does not mean that you do not have to find God and you, do not, you don't have to go through this journey alone. So I think that's another thing that we should do. For me, I... I'm of the view that I make Jesus so appealing to, to queer people. They always ask me, how do you preach? How do you sit in front of ministers and all of that? I say, the, the, the reason why I'm doing that, it's because the one who is in me, who is Jesus, is more appealing than my sexuality. Um, and I, I wish, Cloney, 
the MCSA can invest in, in problematizing queer theology, if what it means within the Wesleyan lens, as to how John Wesley would have conceptualized a different theory of how we think and do sexuality from a queer perspective. And, and I believe that I'll continue to wrestle with the church. Um, when I'm ready, I, I, I have no other church that I'll offer my ministry serve in other than the MCSA. Yeah. So, yeah, but I believe that if church can be done like this, yes. the next generations will, would love and fall in love with Jesus. Yeah, and I think that's, that's been our hope, you know, um, that we don't shy away from the conversations that make us uncomfortable, you know. And, I, you know, my prayer one day is this conversation isn't uncomfortable. I know what you're saying about you never want to nail or tando myself or tonio is it to be comfortable. But I never want it to be at the expense of the LGBTQI community. I never want to sit in, I, I want to be able to, we were actually talking the other day about the whole concept of coming out and all of that, you know. You know, and I want it to be a space where it's like, I don't have to say, you know, this is Tando, my, my lesbian friend. Do you know what I mean? I don't want that to have to be the conversation starter or just like a, just a warning sign almost. You know, I want it to be a point where it, um, who cares? Honestly, who cares? You know, and, but I, I so I, as much as I, I agree with my dad that, that we should never be comfortable in the church because that means we become complacent. But I never, I, I want to get to a point where we can be completely comfortable with the LGBTQI community. Um, I'm, I don't know, else if you want to close, um, I think just want to pray. Just a, just a last thought for me is just to, just how amazing this conversation has been. You know, to be able to hear people's stories, to be able to feel the emotion hearing different people's perspectives, different um, experiences. And I just want to encourage everyone watching us to never stop listening, never stop learning, never stop questioning and asking, because that's truly where I think we find God. If we find God in my comfort zone, is it really an active or a, an accurate reflection of God. I think Jesus comes and he challenges us on, on all kinds of things. And so maybe we need to continue asking, questioning, and applying Jesus and his life as a lens to all of these things. And so maybe as we close up tonight, we can just close in a word of prayer. Mighty God, I thank you that you are indeed a God of love, a God of inclusion, a God who sees us as we are and says, come. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to share spaces like this where we are able to just seek you, God. And I just love what Anele said about making you so irresistible, God. This is not about us, Lord, but about glorifying you and inviting people to come closer to you. And so I just pray that our hearts may be seen, our intentions may be true and in line with what we've done, with, with your will, God, and what we've done. So I just pray that you continue to move our hearts, continue to move our churches, continue to shake our society, God, until it is conformed to what you want, God, and not what we want as human beings. I just pray your blessing of every person watching this tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to invite everyone to join us on Tuesday night for our discussions on Zoom as we continue this conversation this coming Tuesday. We'll see you then. Thanks.